I think I've said before in this room that it is my personal belief that in order to understand religions, we have to know how people treat their dead. That it's how people treat their dead that really determines a lot about what our religious traditions are. The Japanese um, had a, in the Shinto tradition, had a concept of, of the dead which was very specific. Their belief, in, as far as we can tell, was this, that the spirit of the dead people uh, migrated to the mountains. And when they migrated to the mountains, they became kami. They became gods. The dead became divinized. Since they went away to the mountains and became gods, then your ancestors were kami for everybody, not just for you. So the Japanese did not develop the kind of belief in ancestral veneration that you find on the continent. They had an entirely different view, even though when the Confucian tradition came to Japan, there was a turn toward having specific cemeteries, with the names of your deceased, maintenance of those names. The issue about burial, however, uh, always has, I think, indicated that for the Japanese, there has been a feeling of a unification of Japanese people, which you do not find where you have ancestral veneration. The stronger ancestral veneration is the more people are divided into clans and families and separated from a feeling of a general community in which everybody shares a common group of kami. The fact that everybody in a village believes that the kami which are up in the hills are all of theirs, they belong to everybody. And the fact that they believe that when ancestors go to the hills they become kami says a lot about how Japanese religion developed. A question was asked to me during the break about the fact that often we are told that it's Shintoism in Japan which is the religion for life and it's Buddhism which is the religion for death. That is to some degree true because when Buddhism went to Japan, the one thing which Shinto had was a fear of pollution. And the greatest pollution was the pollution of the corpse. So you wanted to make sure that you drug the dead body at least out beyond the gates of a village. They didn't even use burial. They just used exposure. That is, they were pitched by the roadside. And so even up to modern times, there would still, there would, this was still being practiced in some of the outlying regions of Japan. And when officials would come to visit, one of the things that would always say is maybe you better go down the road and try to clear off the, any corpses that are there so it's not so bad for us to travel along. That uh, idea was that the corpse being polluting meant that when the Buddhists came along, the Buddhists did not have corpse pollution. The Buddhists were, uh, had always had a powerful tradition that said that asceticism renders you immune to this pollution. So if you're doing meditation and practice, you're not going to be polluted by coming in contact with corpses and foreigners and other objects. Japanese probably were delighted to find somebody who felt that way. It was like, at last, somebody take care of the dead. Because it was really a tough thing when somebody died and you just expose the body and you drug them away and you could divinize their spirits later on. The real problem was how to have severance from those dead. That is, severance means when you really just give them up and they become kami. The Japanese developed a way to, to do severance. Uh, the Buddhists helped them. The Buddhists said, okay, if we have to take over the dead, so be it. It at least gets us into the culture. <laughs> I really feel that. They could have a, an enormous role to play, and it is still the major money-making
project for most Buddhist temples in Japan. Without the death rituals, most of them would be broke. Uh, so that these groups that do these death rituals, it is, it is a way of survival for them. What they said was, when a person dies, then the first thing you do is you call them Buddha. At the moment of death almost, the dead are divinized. They become Hotoke. They become the Buddha. You give them a new name. You give them a Buddhist name. You make a plaque a little piece of wood with this name on it. You put it on the Buddhist altar. They are worshipped like a Buddha. You light incense in front of their, names, their name tag. After 35 or to 50 years, depending on the traditions in Japan, there used to be the idea, okay, now we've got to be severed from them. So then you take the piece of wood from the old great-great-grandfather and you take off the name. You just scrape it off so there's no name. Then you take the plaque and put it in the kami altar. Now the ancestor has become a kami with no name, has now become just part of a wider sphere. Nobody has to remember their name any longer. They're just kami. Um, that was a way of severance. When you forget the name, that severs, really severs. So they became uh, very much involved with, with, with this. But the other thing which the Buddhists brought to Japan was a brand new idea, and that was judgment of the dead. Most primitive cultures don't have judgment of the dead. That is, the Chinese, for example, had only the idea that the dead go to Mount Tai and they sit in a cave for a very long time. It's, it's not wonderful. They just sit there until they get absorbed back into the earth. They're not judged. They're not punished. Everybody is sitting there waiting. And so if you wanted to feed your dead, you went there to feed them. Everybody was supposed to go there once in their life and feed their dead. In Japan, uh, this idea about about the judgment of the dead was a whole idea which, be, which then was used to create part of the ethical system. In other words, the Buddhists have brought in the concept that because of karma, people are reborn. Now, they can be reborn in various places, but they have to be judged. The Chinese also came to feel you've got to be judged. So the idea was that at death, everybody goes down to hell to be judged by the hell beings, by the hell kings. And the judgments at that time are where they look through the book and they look up all your karma and they got a good record and they say, uh-huh, I see that you did not report this income to the IRS in 19... <laughs> They got everything. They know everything. So you're down there, and you're faced with all of this, and then comes the punishments. Now, for the Buddhist, you don't stay there forever. It's just a place. It's like a, uh, it's a place where you go to get your punishment. And then once, once that's done, you've gotten rid of your bad karma. And then there will be eventually rebirth someplace else. The Japanese took to this enormously. I've tried to understand why it was, because of all the Buddhist countries, I think the Japanese have focused as much as any of them on what these hells were like. The cartoons, the comic books of today still, the drawings that people made, just like this one, which is a part of the way in which people were punished, uh, these death scrolls. But I think that part of it was, as I say, this idea of, of how you do an ethical system with the Buddhist tradition. Buddhism has, has some real problems with trying to create ways in which ordinary people can have an ethical system. Because Buddhism, at its most profound philosophical tradition, 
says, look, something good and something evil is, are definitions that people make of things. We define something as good, and we define something else as bad. And these are cultural definitions. We, we say, well, we think they really are bad, that murder is really bad. But the Buddhist uh, will always come back and say, yes, murder on the street of San Francisco may be bad, <coughs> murder during a war may be heroic. So that we define things all the time. Now, if you have this kind of attitude that you're constantly defining things as to whether they're good and bad, and this is, a, this is often a definition which is given to it, then what about an ethical system? Because then everything seems to be relative. And if everything is relative, then it doesn't matter, is the attitude that might come to ordinary people, say the Buddhists. So consequently, they substitute for this relativity an idea that, okay, if you do certain things, you will have a retribution for them sometime, somewhere, rest assured. It's, um, I, I was thinking about that, that, I went to see this, a movie, uh, Magnolia, and in Magnolia there's one line I love that was repeated several times. You may be finished with the past, but the past is not finished with you. <laughs> But that's Buddhism. <laughs> it's still there ticking away. <laughs> so with this concept, I think that um, the governments and others could see a way to be able to define that if you do bad things, you're going to be punished, and the punishment is severe. Uh, so that this judgment of the dead, which of course characterizes all of the world's religions today, we have judgment of dead in, in all of them. <clears throat> judgment of the dead is, is, is a very interesting study and it's worth doing a lot more with. So for the Japanese with the dead, one of the things which they introduced and the question that was asked me, isn't it the case that maybe Shintoism because it's related to life issues such as New Year and rebirth and all of those wonderful things uh, is more a part of Japanese culture than is Buddhism. But of course always in the background of the Japanese culture is this feeling about judgment of the dead. It never goes very far away. It is there and it plays itself out in many of the things which you see and hear it plays itself out in movies and in, and in novels. It's, it plays itself out in the art in, in lots of different ways. The <coughs> divinization of the dead, however, I think remains. And so on Mount Koya, the world's largest cemetery, this great Buddhist site where everybody wants their ashes so that when Kukai comes back during the time of Maitreya, you'll be ready, you'll be right there. You'll, you'll be available for rebirth. And everybody says, I, I'm willing to put off rebirth until that happens, till a good time to be reborn. The fact that so many people do this and that there's such a drive and a force for the ways in which burial and practices are done. The other thing which Buddhism has, has dealt with in terms of this is, is has come about is the water baby situation, that is aborted fetuses. Because Japan has used abortion as a major way of birth control since World War II ended. And the fact that they, they have had uh, used this as a major form of birth control uh, has led to the development finally of this new movement in Japan which has, has gained enormous power in, in the last few years last few decades, which is that the idea is that a fetus is a water baby, it has no body. And without the body, it can't be reborn. And this makes it a very bad existence for a water baby. And so the Buddhists have supplied an answer to this. And the answer is that the bodhisattva has many bodies. And a bodhisattva is willing to give a body. So you go to Jizo and ask for one of his bodies. Or you can go to Kanon and ask for one of her bodies. 
And so people who are going through this will go and buy a tiny little image of that bodhisattva with toys around the neck and other things and do the prayer which allows that to become the body for the water baby so it then is reborn and everything is okay. So you see not only young couples going to do this, but you see a lot of older women who, who are still dealing with perhaps uh, abortion issues from the past emotionally or otherwise. So once again, in terms of the dead, the Buddhists play a major role. They are right there with some solutions and some answers for people. Because the Mongol dynasty was not able to get to Japan, Buddhism in Japan was left alone. And of all the places in the world uh, that have Buddhism, Japan has been the one place where Buddhism has never really suffered great persecution and suppression. On the other hand, it has not always thrived in equal, equal uh, degrees over various periods of time. One of the things that began to happen as, as Buddhism went along is that the great development in Buddhism of Pure Land. In other words, for traditional Japanese Buddhism, Pure Land was the dominant one. We have a very mistaken idea often about the, the influence and the power of Zen Buddhism. Uh, we are led in this country and in Europe and other places to say if we go to the library and we look up Buddhism, we're going to find that there are 15 books on Zen and one book on Pure Land and therefore we reach the natural conclusion that Zen is a very important part of Japanese Buddhism. It is a tiny little part of Japanese Buddhism, always has been. The Zen te monasteries, temples, by comparison to the Pure Land, have almost no place in, in the Buddhist tradition. They're very small. The Pure Land tradition, which came to dominate in Japan, was, again, the Buddhist answer to troubled times. Japan went through some very difficult times. The Mongols might not have gotten there, but certainly the Japanese had their own internal strife and struggle. All we have to do is to see a samurai movie and you know what it was like. I mean, it was tough. People were being killed right and left. There were, one warlord was fighting another warlord and young men were being trained to go out and make themselves into mercenary soldiers to be hired by one warlord or another. It was, it was from very difficult times for them. In this environment, then, it, was, it came to be that people said, you know, we live in such a bad time. There's no possibility that we can achieve enlightenment in this world. This world is the pits. It is really a bad place. So consequently, we can't, because we happen to have been born at this time in this place, we can't reach an enlightened state here. What can we do? We can have faith. We can have faith in the vow of Amitabha, Amida. He said that if he reached enlightenment and became a Buddha, he would create a pure land. And in that land, everybody who wanted to could be reborn. And when they were in that land, it would be a perfect place to become enlightened. So therefore, the Pure Land tradition became a primary part of the Japanese as they tried to deal with all the upheavals and problems that beset them. Uh, D.T. Suzuki was, of course, the great writer on Zen Buddhism. D.T. Suzuki was a uh, scholar. He was a dedicated uh, Buddhist textual scholar in the Japanese system. He translated things into English, but he also did work with Sanskrit and Chinese. And then after the age of 60, because he had been an English teacher, he never taught Buddhism in Japan. He never could get a position. He only taught English. His English was very good. Um, he started translating things into English. And then he, in the 30s, wrote his first book after he was 60 on Zen Buddhism in English. 
And his books became bestsellers in terms of religious ideas. They be certainly became bestsellers in terms of Asian. Everybody began to read D.T. Suzuki's books on Zen, loved them, still read them. They stay in print. They are reprinted every year. I always, I always go back and think about that. I, I once took a class from D.T. Suzuki, interesting man. At that time, he was in his 80s. Um, I felt sorry for him because he really had the idea that none of us would understand it, but yet he taught it. And he wrote his books with the idea that nobody who reads this in English will really understand it, but still he wrote them. But I always liked it that at the end of D.T. Suzuki's life, he said, I've written all these books about Zen and how if you meditate, you'll reach enlightenment and you'll get satori and you can get through. And he said, I have to admit I haven't done it. <laughs> and I can't do it in this life. I'm not going to be an enlightened person. He was very honest. I'm not going to be an enlightened person. And he said, the only hope for me is Am Amida's Pure Land. So his last book was written on Pure Land. He returned to the Pure Land tradition. I think that for most Japanese, that Pure Land tradition, in the end, comes to them. This is the one that's the most important for them. It is the dominant theme of traditional Japanese Buddhism. I think when Buddhism came to the US, particularly here to San Francisco, and among the Japanese immigrant communities, almost all of the Japanese immigrants who came to the United States belonged to the Pure Land tradition. The vast majority of them did. There were a few who came who belonged to Nichiren. There were a few occasionally with Zen, but in, in general, they were Pure Land followers. When Zen monks began to come to the US, like Senzaki, Nyogen Senzaki, and others, or when Suzuki Roshi came here and formed the San Francisco Zen Center as a major part of Japanese Buddhism in a way, their only hope to have a real audience was not among the Japanese because Zen among Japanese is a rarity, not an ordinary thing. If they were going to have a community, they had to reach out to a community beyond the Japanese community. And so just by the nature of what Japanese Buddhism was like, it was reflected here in San Francisco that it was the Zen group that reached out to the Americans, or as Rick Fields calls himself, white Buddhists. Uh, it was not uh, a tradition which had the power to simply stay as a major social institution among the Japanese immigrants. So what was going on in Japan is reflected here even in our own country with, with regard to this. The other thing about Zen is that it made such beautiful art, and everybody loves Zen art. And it, it, it has an enormous influence in poetry and art, far beyond its numbers. This was an elite group that liked the things that they produced. But in terms of Japanese Buddhism, you must always keep in mind it was small. It was a marginal group. <laughs> and the main group was the Pure Land group. During these times of trouble, uh, one of the things that happened for the Japanese that left behind some marvelous things for us is that because people were on the move, because things were so disturbed, uh, because of the troubles in Japan, they began to develop portable altars. And the portable altar became a kind of talisman that people would carry with them. And at any time or any place they were, or whenever there was trouble, they would always have before them a portable altar. And some of them are, are just wonderful. They're small, lots of them. Here's an example of one that I'm picturing here for you. These portable altars were an indication that things were happening in the Japanese society and culture, which meant that, that it was not stable, I think. I believe port portable altars tell you something very much about a people. That is, if, if things are 
not disturbed, there's no real reason in a way for one to have these sorts of things. The other thing that happened is I showed you those wonderful guardian figures. Japanese Buddhism had these wonderful guardian figures that I showed you, powerful creatures. And yet as time went by and, and Buddhism became so much a part of the Japanese environment, all of a sudden here's one of those guardian figures. But what is it? It's a, it's a toggle for clothing. It's a netsu, netsuki. It's, it means that the Buddhist tradition has undergone a change. And Bodhidharma, the great Zen one, here he shows up on a clothes toggle, a tiny little figure on, on a brush. It indicates that Japanese Buddhism had undergone, number one, acculturation, I suppose. It had been absorbed into society. On the other hand, it was no longer held in the kind of awe that it had been previously. The minute you began to see people uh, making ashtrays out of Buddha figures, you know that they either don't, they're not believers or the power has gone out of the image. Anytime you see when people start to uh, make use of a religious symbol but use it in a way which is not so sacred, it says something has happened. They're now not looking at it in the same way. So I can't tell you that Japanese Buddhism thrived and always uh, progressed in a, in a great line of progression toward being greater and greater, stronger and stronger. In fact, I think what was beginning to happen to it in Japan is that without some of the challenges that are faced from the outside, it did become moribund in lots of ways. It did become fixed into a pattern which was not filled with, with life and practice. When World War II came, Japanese Buddhism was in a pretty bad place. The Meiji reform had come about in 1868. The Shinto tradition had been brought to the fore. Every uh, shrine had to make a decision about whether it was Buddhist or Shinto. In other words, it was hard for them to decide which one are we. Families would have to get together and say, well, which way will we go? Should we go Shinto or should we go Buddhist? It was up to them. And they didn't know which way because they'd never had to make this decision before. They could have both Shinto elements and Buddhist elements in the same place. Now the government said, we're going to use Shinto as a political strategy, so therefore we don't want any of our Shinto things in a Buddhist shrine. They have to be separate and, and put to one side. Faced with this, Buddhism in, in its traditional forms was heading into very, t very tough times. These traditional groups survived for two basic reasons, I think. First of all, because we live in such a bad time, nobody can reach enlightenment. The Japanese also revised Buddhism so that you have married priests. And because they had married priests, they could have hereditary priests. And that is, you inherit the temple from your father whether you have a religious vocation or not is not the issue. While that can spiritually be a problem for the structure itself, it's a way to maintain it. I have a friend who's a professor and he really wanted to remain a professor, but when his father died, he said, I have to leave the university, I have to go back to the temple because it's my mother's home. And if I'm not the priest, then the priest will take over that house and my mother will have to leave her home. I can't do that to her. And he became a, a priest in order for his mother to be able to continue to live in the family home as they had grown up there and felt it had been theirs for generations. Hereditary priesthood then helped them to survive as well as the death rituals. When World War II was over and Japan was faced with rapid change in the whole question of what would happen, then the Buddhist tradition gave Japan an entirely new kind of Buddhism, which we call the new religions. Sokagakai, Risho Kosekai, Rei Yukai. Lay groups arose all over Japan. Millions of people were attracted to them. 
These were lay groups that held chanting in unison, formed groups that were like study groups or almost like group therapy. And it, it was these groups that dominated the whole of, of the development of Japanese Buddhism in a new way. And it's still going on. People are still trying to sort this out in terms of the role of these groups. Because Japan had this development that was Buddhist and Shinto, these groups were either Buddhist or Shinto, uh, the Christian missionary movement in Japan never thrived after World War II. It did thrive in Korea, and Korean Christianity grew by leaps and bounds, after, particularly after the Korean War. The Korean Buddhists had no such development as this, but in Japan, Buddhism was able, I think, to maintain its predominance because of these lay groups that arose, which met the needs of people in a new, changing urban environment where people had left their old home villages and needed a community of people to support them. So I think when we look at, at Japanese Buddhism, we can see great periods of grandeur. We can see wonderful times when it had great support from emperors and when it dominated the landscape with its magnificent buildings. We can see times when people began to look on it with jaundiced eyes and look down on it. And we can see when people in a brand new Japan faced with, for the first time, something which the Mongols had not accomplished is that finally they were invaded and they had lost a war. And now US airplanes landed at Tokyo and it was over. They had to deal with that and the Buddhist came forward with this particular answer with the new religions to say if you chant, if you do this, you'll have good luck and good fortune. You can get that refrigerator if you want it. You can have the new car. You can have a house. You can have all these things. And these answers that were given then allowed Buddhism to remain as strong as it is today. It is still the major religion of Japan in many ways. It is the tradition which everybody participates in, just as everybody participates at a Shinto shrine. But I think that it has always fulfilled certain aspects of Japanese life which are extremely important to them. It has helped to produce their art. It's helped to produce their architecture. It has helped to produce their gardens. And it has helped to produce a situation in which Japan has the facility and has had the facility to adapt and change and address the issues of industrialization and urbanization. It was the Buddhist traditions of these new ones, I think, that came forward at that time and made an enormous contribution to urban life, even more so than the, than the Shintos. The Shinto tradition was unable to respond very well to this new situation of defeat. The end of the reign of the divine emperor caused them enormous troubles. So. Uh, when I look at Japanese Buddhism, I, I see it as one of the important elements of the tradition of East Asia, and I also see it as something which has had enormous influence in the world, and it has certainly influenced us here in California. We owe a debt of gratitude to the Japanese Buddhist, and I think that Japan owes a debt of gratitude also to the Buddhists who have produced and given them so much of their cultural patterns. Thank you.